so yeah let's get started so yeah I'm going to talk about the open GDS the open source group development suite so I'm Michael Holmstrom I'm born in Sweden but currently live in Australia first I'm going to do a shout out to Sweden's first programmer oops uh, that's Elsa Karin Bostad Nilsson Sweden's first computer programmer. She was working for the Swedish uh, Defense Research Agency, and she was a mathematician and a physicist, and she programmed the first computer in Sweden. Um, and um, she became the head of the calculation department, and they basically just hired uh, women in that department. So they become the first Swedish programmers. In later year of her programming career, she was also noticed by young Swedish game developers who saw her as a pioneer in gaming. So that's a quick shout out for her. My uh, LabVIEW career started in 96 when I converted from text-based programming to uh, LabVIEW, and I did it in 96. And from 96, I've been doing LabVIEW full-time. Uh, in 98, two years later, I attended one of the first object-oriented LabVIEW courses in Sweden, and that changed my mind. So everything after that, I saw everything as object, and I wanted to model the LabVIEW code in classes. Unfortunately, it took quite some years before classes was uh, natively supported in LabVIEW, but in the beginning, we created different tools that uh, helped us use classes in LabVIEW before that. But what is OpenGDS? So yes, it's an addition to your LabVIEW ID that helps you uh, handle classes and interfaces more productively. And also it has a uh, feature to visualize classes. We use uh, uh, UML, uh, diagrams for that. Okay, so quickly, how do you install it? Yep, we have a, it's on GitHub. Uh, we have a landing site, opengds.github.io, where you can download pre-compiled uh, versions. And it's good to write, uh, download the right version for your operating system and bits, because then it doesn't have to recompile it. Uh, so yeah, you just uh, download it, unless you want to go, go to the GitHub and clone it. But you can download a pre-compiled version and you just unzip it and you have a VI package in there where you can use VI package manager to install it. Or you can use the installer VI that is a bit faster to install the toolkit into your IDE. After that, you just restart LabVIEW and off you go. After you start LabVIEW, you will see that you will have some extra menus in the tools menu under tools group or in the toolbar where you have uh, some extra icons. So let's see, how do you do the first initial configuration maybe if you want to do that? You go to the class provider options and where you have a list of the different class providers. A class provider is a way of uh, how the class should look like and feel. And we have three different versions. We have the by value class, uh, that is the native one uh, that comes with LabVIEW. And then we have two reference versions. We have a reference based on DVR, we call it group four, and one that was before DVR existed, we call that group three. So if you click on the configure class provider, you can set some default behaviors of your uh, class provider. The first is you can set the class item icon, which color you like to have. If, if you don't want to have the blue native one, you can have default connector pane of all your classes and VIs in that. Um, and some default wiring configuration you like to have on your class wire. So when you create a class, you can then select the different types. We have the by value on the left there, native one, and you have the reference based with the DVR, it uses the in placement element structure you see there, or the group three, it uses the lock and an unlock VI. So let's just get started with a uh, quick demo then. So I'm going to create a class. I'm going to say the group class, and I'm going to create the name file, for instance. OK, I can select here as well. Uh, if I want to change change uh, the icon, uh, the connector pane, uh, and wire style, and all that. Or I can also, first I can select which class provider. I can switch class provider order to here. Uh, now you can see that class group 3 is ex doesn't exist because you can actually hide it and you can change the order. So you have your preferred uh, class provider in top of your list there. And then, yep, I'm just going to create this class and it creates it in the project and in a separate folder. And there you go. Often I 
change the color or you can change the background color. I normally just randomize it and that's a good one for me. So now I have created my first class. Easy. Okay. No more no questions so far. So let's get keep going. So uh, you can after you created a class, you can of course add it the class uh, appearance, and you can uh, you have three options. You under right click group, and you have edit class icon. That goes back to the dialog box where you can again change the color and the header uh, of your class. You also have some library icons. You can, if you don't like the cube there, you can change it to images. We have actor. Normally, you you have a bit of different image for that or messages and stuff like that. The edit class uh, appearance. Here again, you can set uh, oops, you can set the class uh, I, item icon and the wire configuration if you want to change that for your class. You have a quick selection as well to set the class uh, item icon. So if you want to have different colors of your class to be able to distinguish them. Okay creating a subclass or a child class from a parent class. So how do you do that? Yep, you can right click on your existing class and select new and then select group create derived class. That will be a child class from file. Or if you create a brand new class, you can actually further down select which parent you want to inherit from. And we our subclasses or child classes templates we have, we always call the base class constructor inside there. So this is the uh, encrypted file class that is inheriting the file, so it actually always calls the file creator, so we can uh, it can actually initialize itself. So, okay, change to that demo. I'm going to right click on file, new group derived class, and I'm going to create an encrypted file. Maybe different color of that. I don't know. And done. Yeah, that's good. Headers e file. And yep, just gonna take this one. So in the crate, I often maybe want to select which encryption method this class should use. And normally you have a maybe a type def like that for different encryption methods. Here I'm going to show you where. So this one is not a type def yet. So I'm going to create, make it a type def, open the type def, and I'm going to save it in the same folder as this uh, class. So I'm going to call it called pipe, just create it in that folder. And, but now it doesn't have a nice icon and it doesn't belong to the class. I actually want like it to add to the class. So it's sitting down here. I can of course drag it in, but I'm gonna just go tools, group, create VI icon. It automatically detects that, ah, this should probably belong to this class. Do you want to add it? Yes, I want to add it. Automatically gets a header from the class and base the VI the icon based on the VI name. So done. And that's how I often create uh, type devs. And I just open them, save them in the class, and then create the icon. And that automatically adds it to the, to the class. OK, next one, adding a method. So you can right click on a class and say group add method. And it brings up a dialog box where you have a lot of options. Let's demo that as well then. So, I want to create a method, a VI method in this as a group add method. And here I can then then create my maybe encrypt VI or whatever. We have different method templates. So how do you want that uh, VI to look like? So it doesn't create just an empty blank VI. You can select different templates, how you want it to look like, if you want to read or write or read and write. And of course, this will match whatever provider you have. So if you have a by value class, it will be a normal uh, unbundled and bundled by name on the class wire. You can even select uh, non-modifying methods or even static. Static is when you don't have any references in or out or, or wire, class wires in and out. Uh, you can also select that you want to override a method. Then you, on the right side, you have a list of which VIs you can override. So by doing that, it will, of course, Link the name, it will, the name will be exactly the same as the parent, but you still have the option to select which uh, template uh, it should 
you should use. And of course, when you do this, the connector pane will match, of course, the parent's connector pane. Then we have something called property method. That is, if you want to read or write some properties from your class. And this one only has one property, it's attribute one. So you can say get property or set property. And here you can see how the icon, uh, the VIs will look like. And it will create those for, for you. Uh, property node, that is the same thing, but it uses the property node instead. So it's going to create those VIs for you. In this case, I want to create just normal called encrypt because this VI should just and do handle the encryption depending on which type it is and encrypt some data stream. And in this case, I might want to change the visibility of this one. I might want to change the private, protected community, or I can actually select which folder, virtual folder or real folder I shall uh, place it in. And in this case, this class has a virtual folder uh, it's a vector pass is called private, and maybe I want to put it in there, so uh, it will um, uh, become uh, that access scope right away. You can even add right away extra virtual folder, real folders, and different scope here, so you can add more more folders right away. Then you have two method, two buttons: create or create and open. I often use create and open because often I want to open the VI straight after creation. In this case, it uses the uh, read uh, pattern and uh, read temp uh, template, and this is how the VI looks like. Easy, so let's see. Okay, no questions so far, so let's keep going. Uh, cloning in class. Uh, so I have a fluke um, child class from a multimeter, and I want to basically make a copy of it. So one way you can just right click on the class and select goop clone class. It gives you option just select your new name. It will automatically create a folder for that, and it will then create your uh, sibling class and uh, your key side class there. And you can rename a class as well. So this uh, class mult voltmeter. I uh, may maybe I want to call it multimeter instead. You, you just right click, group, rename class, and you just type in the new name and it creates the folder and will of course move that uh, voltmeter class to this new folder and also it will relink all the VIs in memory. But if you click on this relink the whole project um, checkbox, it will uh, relink all VIs in the project by opening all VIs in the project to make sure they are in memory when it does this renaming so they all get re relinked to the new uh, class name. You can also rename a method very easy. You just right click on the on the VI and uh, in the method of the class and select group rename VI. And here, for instance, I want to rename the get voltage that is in the multimeter base class. And then the rename function actually will, of course, right away uh, update the icon for you. So you don't have to do that. But also, it sees that there are child classes with the same method get voltage and it will suggest that you want to rename those as well. In the bottom corner you see that three uh, VIs will be renamed when I rename this one. You can uh, untick any classes with the checkboxes there in the list to not rename them if you want to. Okay, cloning a method. If you want to add an extra method in this key site, it's missing this measure resistance. So either we can just add the method with the normal add method function. You select the override method and just click on multimeter and then you'll get a blank VI basically. But in this case, you might want to clone the VI. Then you just right click on the Flux version, measure resistance, you select group, clone VI, and it asks you where do you want to clone it? So you can clone this to the same class, but of course probably with a different name then, or you can clone it to a different class by selecting the new VI owner. So here you can select them the key side class, and then it will automatically um, clone that method for you. You can also select I want to select I want to see all the sibling classes, and you get a list of all that, and you can then select if you have multiple sibling classes that you want to clone it to. So if you have a big hierarchy tree and you add one VI in one class and you want that to be copied to all other classes in that uh, hierarchy tree, you can use this function. Or you can also select clone to VI to select the class so that maybe you're going to see all classes in the project, not just the, your hierarchy tree, hierarchy tree. You also have an override target VI. So 
if the one of the VIs already exists, you have to uh, confirm that you actually want to overwrite the target, and then you clone it. It will then overwrite that VI. It does create a copy or backup uh, of that VI before it overwrites it. So the cloning feature will look for VIs and type tests with similar names in the target class and replace the cloned VI content with those. So in this example, when I'm cloning from the Fluke to Keysight, it finds that the class controls, of course, shouldn't be the Fluke. It should be the Keysight class controls, input and output. And the helping VI, something called get attributes, it will replace it to the Keysight's version of get attributes. So yeah, the code should be runnable right away. OK, uh, question that maybe I missed this, but does this toolkit work with regular level classes? Yes, yes, it works with uh, uh, by value classes as well. Absolutely. Uh, all this feature works with by value classes as well. So yeah, uh, and all, yeah, so it doesn't matter which, which uh, if it's by value or by reference, yes. Uh, why I show by reference is because, yeah, people are not familiar with that, but yeah. Uh, and also, I use by reference classes a bit more than by value classes. Uh, every time I need to split the wire, then I use by reference, but as long as I don't need to split the wire, then I can stick to by value classes. Unless it, yeah, there's some uh, restriction for that as well, but yeah, good. Um, actors as well. Yes, we have actor support as well. I'll show you a show example of that very soon. So, um, so you have, uh, if you want to change an icon of a VI, you can right click on the VI, select like group, edit icon. Or you open the VI and you can go uh, select tools, group, create VI icon. So there's two ways of adding, updating, uh, uh, viewing the uh, icon editor. Let's close everything, open the next one. So here, get measurement. I'm going to right click on it and say group, edit icons. So you saw this quickly before, but let's see what it's doing here. So uh, often it tries to create the body text here based on the VI name. And uh, here it actually used OCR. It actually analyzed the previous text and tried to realign it to whatever the order it was. So if I click skip OCR, it goes back to the native one. It's just using get temperature. That's exactly what the uh, VI looks like, but you see it doesn't fit all in. That's why yeah, the OCR will, we did, did this one. So in this case, I want to call it maybe just get temp, or maybe I want to have a space in there and you can send maybe a left alignment and you can move the text around if you want to have it there. Okay, easy. Then you have icon selections and uh, you can select uh, add icons. And now here I want to search for just the temp. Oops. Temp. And I just want to have a temperature thing there. So yeah, now we have this get temperature. Maybe I just move that around a little bit. So yeah, it's easy to find. So yeah, so that's how you can um, add icons as well. It's not as you can't have multiple icons. Not that. This one only support one icon at the moment. But since it's on GitHub, yeah, you can just clone it and uh, do a pull request and whatever, and then we can add it. Okay, uh, clear icon. I uh, just, yeah happy with that so maybe i want to remove the header you can do that if you want to fit more text in uh, you could also uh, edit the header if you want this header this header of course belongs to the class but you can specify that i want to have a special header on this one if you click on that one you get the option to edit the library header or the vi li uh, header especially this so if you go library header it will be for the whole class all the vi's in the class will be updated but if you just select the VI header, you can just specify uh, your own header uh, for this particular VI if you want to. Yep, and then you have a little bit of uh, text um, control here as well if you want to use that. Then uh, you can also select if you want to have a bit smaller icon. If you select um, two terminal version, it actually shows you how it will reorganize uh, the ter terminal layout and uh, move them around so you can actually get uh, get everything uh, in one uh, in that size of the of the vi anyway that's a little bit quickly some of the features the icon editor has so 
we have another version of the icon editor. So in this case, I got a driver from a vendor and the icon is very easy to understand what all the VI does, doesn't it? I guess they were lazy, they just copy. They did update some of them, but most of them is the same. So yeah, how do I go ahead with this one? Yeah, so you have a feature that if you right click on the um, virtual, on a virtual folder instead of group, you get an auto update all VI icons. So I did that. Before it starts, it gives you a little bit of um, helping thing. So it asks you if I want to remove any uh, strings from the VI names because it uses the VI names to create the icon and to fit fit the bit long text in, it's better to maybe remove some text. And on the left, so you have all the TLPM prefixes or PM103 prefixes. So I'm going to say that I'm going to remove all these text in the VI names and also I do some conversion. So if the VI is called measure, I'm going to rename it to mesh, average would be AVG and so on. And after running this one, uh, yeah, the VIs will be a little bit easier to read. So yeah. So now, yeah, there makes more sense. Okay. Okay. Design patterns. Uh, these are extra functionalities that, you can, that can be added to a class to enhance its functionalities. These are plugin architecture, and you can easily add your own design patterns. Uh, a design pattern can specify what class type it supports. So maybe you create one that's only val uh, applicable to by value classes. You can do that. And also, a uh, design pattern can also add extra method templates to a class. So how do you add them? You right click on a class and select group, add design patterns. You get a dialog box of all the design patterns currently found and you can select one. Or you can also add design patterns by, when you create a new class from scratch, you click on the add design pattern button and it gives you a list of all the design patterns you can add. This way you can add multiple design patterns in one go. So, to see what design patterns you have added to a class, you can actually view that under group, get class information. It shows you what design pattern has been added to this class. So you might get these extra method templates if you added some design patterns. So when you create a method, you'll have some extra functionalities that actually this design patterns uh, helps you to uh, provide. So let's go for next demo. Okay, this is a by reference class, um, just for to show that I split the wire. So even if I split the wire, both these get number will uh, refer to the same instance because it's a reference here. And um, they just read the attribute and if it's 100, it will stop. But yeah, nothing of course modify. I could have a second, a third loop here that actually updates this number and then uh, this number will be um, incrementing and a stop. But now I'm going to do this with, an, with a design pattern. I'm going to use an active object design pattern. The active object is that the object becomes active. That means when I create uh, this class, it spins, spins off a um, process, a daemon process in the background that actually has access to the attribute that could modify and read the attribute for this class. So in this case, I'm going to create something that in the background updates this number and this will actually just read, read, read and hopefully this number will increment. So how do we do that? So let's go to the class, we right click, I select group, add design pattern. I'm going to use a queued to and from process. Select next, I'm just going to go next there, I'm going to skip the, yep. And then we have now created it has then this design pattern adds a few extra VIs. It adds a process VI and also adds a stop and a st uh, start and a stop process VIs. And those also gets automatically added into your uh, create and destructor. And this will start the process. And when I do destroy it, this will stop the process. So what does this one do then? It just waits for some incoming message. In this case, uh, if it doesn't get, get anything, it will go to timeout. And in the timeout, I'm going to put some VI here. This is the reference that belongs to this uh, instance of the object. And this one just does some increment. And 
that will just increment. And when I run it now, you see both these are now upgrading and counting. So that's active object. I use that a lot. Could be for monitoring things in the background and stuff. Yeah. So the next example is a design pattern here. I'm using three design patterns. So we've got the first design pattern is singleton design pattern. And that one is not added really by uh, add design pattern. It's actually a class template. So when you create the class, you can select a different template here. In this provider, I have two templates. And uh, and you can actually, here I'm hiding one template, but you can add more templates and all that. Uh, this, the DV, singleton DVR template is a template where you don't need to have the reference. So every time you only have one object hanging around. So um, you can, that means you can easily access this without having the wire for that class uh, or that, yeah, to from that object to another. So that's the singleton design pattern. The second one is another active object here. I have an active pro process for this uh, Clippy object. So every time I create a Clippy, uh, a Clippy process gets created. In this example, I'm going to create a Clippy object every time I click my mouse on a uh, pitch control. So it's going to create multiple objects. And for every object, I'm going to run a process. The third design pattern here is class attributes. Class attributes are shared memory space between all objects created of this class. So this is a memory space in here that I can only use in this, this all, all these Clippy classes, and but they share the memory space. So if I increment this one for one object, the other one will then get the same number. And what this done, it will actually just increment a counter all the time I call this VI. And that actually information goes to an ID of this Clippy. So all my Clippy will get a unique new ID. And why do I need the ID? Yeah, that ID actually defines some animation. If I click here, it will be uh, this Mr. Clippy object has this uh, animation and all the, all the one. And these are running then separate uh, processes and yeah. I don't have to care about that in this application. It doesn't know anything about this. It's very simple. So easy. OK, let's keep going. OK, probing or debugging reference classes. OK, by value classes, it's easy. You just probe the wire, no problem. But by reference class, when you probe the wire, you actually get a reference number. For group four, you get a DVR reference number. And yeah, that doesn't say anything. So how do you? see the real data there. Let's have a look. So if I just probe this wire here, ah, uh, yep. Oh, no, sorry. I should, I should, uh, I should uh, if I do normal, normal probe. Uh, generic probe. So this is how the probe looks like. Uh, yeah, just reference if you run this one. Yeah, it doesn't uh, tell you anything, does it? So, but then if you right click and select a custom probe, I have a reference class probe. It looks like that. And I can put one there as well. And if I run this now, now I can actually see uh, what's going on in this. So that's a extra reference probe. So you just right click and it's a custom probe that gets installed in um, in your probe, common probes. So that's how you can view that. Then you also have a group debugger that allows you to see all the objects in memory. Uh, and uh, you also can then see the different class types and uh, you can select them and view the data of them or all of them in one. To get that working for group four, you actually have to uh, add two design patterns. Um, we did that so because group four is a minimalistic class. It doesn't have any extra VIs. But to get the debugging working, you have to add two extra VIs. In, in the group three, we had all these extra VIs added from the start. So then you didn't need to add any design patterns. But we wanted the group four to be as small as possible and then just add this uh, when you really need them. So let's quick look what that can look like. So this one. So 
oh, I'm going to open the debugger. You can do that either by on the tools menus or by this icon here. And I'm running it. And here you see the five different objects that has been created. So it's a full loop, five objects, and I just modify them. And yeah, easy. Uh, of course, this is not possible by a value class because there's no way of peeking into the data. It, it's only work with by reference classes, group three or group four. Easy. And this one will stop if there's an error. So actually, I can actually kill an object here. If I kill that one, it will stop because it tries to access that object and doesn't exist anymore, and that's it. Uh, you can also turn on or off the debugging for a particular project. So yeah, uh, yeah, just submit, minimize overheads and stuff like that. So that's how you can do that. Okay, interfaces, yes. Um, so interfaces, yes, we do need interfaces. Yep, it helps us make reusable components. Here are some uh, two small examples where potentially you can use uh, interfaces. Uh, in here, maybe I want to have this a method in this class to be called every 100 milliseconds. Of course, I can just create a loop uh, that, that does this in the, in the background in parallel of my application, for instance, but I can create a reusable library for this. And so I had an add a periodic trigger library. It has a, a private process that actually uh, triggers uh, your VI uh, or your class. And by doing that, it actually triggers, uh, uses the interface, uses it with the trigger VI inside, and it actually calls this trigger VI of this interface periodically every 100 milliseconds in this example. And as long as you inherit from this uh, interface, then and you then wire your class reference into this uh, start periodic trigger, it will then be able to uh, feed that to this uh, periodic trigger process that can actually call the trigger function of your class uh, continuously in 100 mil for 100 milliseconds intervals. So that's a way of uh, doing a small reusable library. So this library it doesn't know anything about your code, but it does know that you have a trigger VI because that's what you need to have if you inherit the interface. And, then you can get uh, this triggering going. Here's another example, uh, maybe a folder monitoring a library. I have an interface with two methods that you will, uh, will have to implement. It's uh, files added or files removed. So this small um, mon folder monitoring will monitor a folder you tell it to, and as soon as a file gets added or file gets removed, it will call these interface VIs. And if you implement those properly, yeah, you're going to get the calls into your class, maybe your watch class in this example. So that's why we need it. So how do you inherit from interfaces? Yep, so when you create a class, further down at the bottom, you have the option to select which interfaces you'd like to inherit from. So you just uh, select your folder alert interface there, for instance, you can select that how do you want to create all the methods for that folder alert interface right away. And by default, it says create all interface, but you can select other options there. Uh, you can also, if you have an existing um, class and you want to add an interface, of course, you select group manage interfaces. So then you get a list of all the interfaces uh, in your project. And if you just tick on it, yeah, it will automatically add these two VIs, files added and files removed. Easy to add and uh, add, add uh, files, add interfaces. Okay, so how do you generate an interface? Yep, you go uh, new from my computer, for instance, and go group interface. So let's, oh yeah, let me show that as well. So generate interface. So empty project, right click, uh, new group interface. Uh, so I'm going to create a list interface. Uh, it's an interface. So normally we have these interface icons. Yeah. So maybe I want to have the maybe pinkish version of this. By default, it uses underscore interface as a folder suffix where it puts all the VIs under this folder, but you can change that to whatever you like. I often use a different wiring scheme for all my interfaces, maybe a yellow one, for instance. 
then uh, you can actually select other interfaces you want to inherit and yep easy you can inherit other interfaces as well and then you can create the vi's or the methods that you want to have in this interface right right here if you want to so yeah i'm gonna do it this way i'm gonna uh, have something called add remove remove and find for instance so yep it will then create those methods for me it asks so how do i want the icon to look like that's good swedish colors why not and here you go and then of course you just uh, have to update the vis to your liking easy active framework yep yeah, ryan here it comes to um, your question so active framework yep yeah, um so first of all, you right click on my computer and you have the option to say under actor to add active framework. It will find the active framework version you have on your system. And when you add it, the first thing you actually need to do is of course, to add that library into your project. That's how you add active framework. And after that, you can create a new class. Let's say I want to create a new actor, I call it my actor. And uh, you, for an actor, you need to inherit from the base actor and you see that in the uh, select parent uh, option there, you can select the actor. As soon as you select actor, it adds some extra class templates. Uh, it has a basic actor. Uh, it has a basic actor that's not inside the LV lib and an actor with UI. Uh, and so if I select the actor with UI, it will create a uh, my actor library there. Um, my actor library with uh, the, of course the actor class and also it creates a message folder and uh, it starts off with the default um, message and uh, this default main application that you run and when I run the main application and press the start button it will send up the start measurement um, message to my actor and the actor core will start up and show a window like this. So easy to get started with uh, Actor. You just need to right-click, add Actor Framework, right-click, create a class and inherit from the Actor and then select maybe the UI to get started. And then you have your first uh, up and running uh, Actor working. Okay, visualize classes. We do that in UML, in Unified Modeling Language. So, so we, we use it to show the architecture of your code. Uh, we can see the dependency between classes and interfaces. And you can open it in multiple ways by from the tools menu or from, you can right click on a class or my, my project, or you can click on the UML icon up in the upper right corner there. So let's go and do that. Uh, yep. So um, let's just, Make this application and I'm going to just view it in UML and I'm going to do reverse engineering. It analyzes the classes and it shows you in UML notation. UML notation is like a block uh, rectangle with um, actor framework library is too. I'll, look at it later i'm just going to finish this one first okay uh, so um, um so the it shows all the classes uh, in a box uh, with the first the name and the attribute and the methods and it uh, draws it uh, in a box in with three compartments um you also can uh, press shift to get some information about it you press shift when you're on top of it it gives you uh, information about that class and also if you were a method it shows you the method like that one thing it's really good i use a lot is this dependency here this is dependency so the test result is dependent on the file data source class and if i click shift when i move that i can actually see what the dependence is so it means that this test result create is using the file data source create, my destroy is using destroy of this class, and the save result is using the right data. So I have a dependency from here to here. So this test result is depending on the file data source, but not the other, other way around. And if I open the save result, I can do that by control, double click on it. 
And uh, as you can see that this same result is using the uh, write data method in the file data class. So if you know a lot about design patterns, you see right away that this is the decorated design pattern. So it's uh, you have a data source and then you can decorate this with some extra stuff. And this example is decorating it with this file data source with some encryption or compression functionalities. Um, so if you don't know anything about, if you, if you want to know more about uh, design patterns, you can right click and apply design patterns and you can actually see and read about more of these design patterns, for instance. And by doing that, you can actually also, after that, you can actually generate code from UML. So you can go both directions, both generate and, uh, and analyze. And you can actually add stuff here as well, a method, hello, and then you can actually also synchronize code from UML as well. Oh, I'll just ignore that for now, but yeah, let's. So yeah, so it just added this hello method now. So yeah, that's a little bit of um, what you can do with a UML model. Okay, uh, I think we have time to uh, you know, show a demo here of the state machine as well. So yeah. Uh, the UML model comes with class diagram, but also with state diagram. And that is uh, a perfect way of visualize a state machine. So if you have a state machine, maybe the JKI version. So you can open the VI and go tools, UML and view VI in state, state diagram, and you get the state diagram uh, as well. You can just do a quick demo there. So that's the code. I go tools, UML viewing state diagram and here you see all the states and you can actually also select if you want to have um, it should add uh, documentation so you get the documentation in there as well um, yep and then uh, if you do a small one and then you have some also some uh, auto placement tools so it's easier to place them around as well if you want to play with, with the how you should visualize them. So I press OK, and then you have your state machine that way. OK, well, better hurry up. A lot of things to show. OK, class tools. Uh, if you right-click on a, a class and um, you select group class tools, you can modify some behavior of the class. Uh, you can, for instance, modify the connector pane of all the VIs. Uh, and um, so you can go from maybe 444 to uh, maybe a 686 or whatever. It will modify all the VIs and try to relink re them. Uh, you can actually select multiple classes as well. So you see, oh, I want to, oh, maybe a whole um, hierarchy instru structure or hierarchy, inheritance hierarchy or so. You can modify multiple of them. You can also change the connector name, that is the class uh, control indicators. Uh, a lot of people have different naming conventions there. Uh, we, some people would like to have the class name in, class name out, or just a class name, or object in, object or reference. And you can then uh, mass uh, change uh, classes this way as well. OK, uh, some um, quick drop support. Or actually, it's uh, under the um, function palette you have on a group, you have some three VIs that will uh, place its contents on the block diagram instead of the sub-VI. And uh, we have um, three versions of this. This is uh, for group four. It's the IP structure. So you don't have to create an empty IP within uh, the create and the DVRs create uh, read and write uh, nodes there. So I have three already uh, and often link those to quick drop shortcuts. So I do IP1, IP2, IP3. So I can quickly add those on the block diagram. We also have an uh, IPA, uh, IPI, uh, API to it. So you can actually create classes programmatically and create attributes and methods as well, and uh, clone classes and stuff like that using API. This API is then actually, I'm using that for a fun tool called convert text-based code to LabVIEW. Uh, let's show a demo for that. So I'm gonna go tools, group, 
conversion, create text-based program. So I'm going to select some C code that I just grabbed from GitHub. I'm going to go next, and I'm going to get this started, and then say I'm going to, where do I want to create this folder? I want to create them, or maybe I'll create them in that folder. Uh, current folder, press create classes, continue. While it's doing that, I'm going to also show it, it pops up, you show here what it's going to create. It's going to create a class called this, and here class and one interface, and it shows the attributes it's going to um, create. This is going to create an attribute, a map. Uh, it was in C code, it was a uh, dictionary with this is the key and this is the value and this is the name. And then it's going to create methods. It's going to create uh, one method there and one method there with the correct input and outputs. And yep. And what is this? This is some um, bubble tea shop it's going to create. So then it creates all the classes, all the methods. It doesn't do all the coding needed in the VI, but it does help you a lot. So in C, it starts with the program main, and it's going to do this. It's going to say, OK, this one, in this main VI, you're going to create a bubble tea shop. So if I want to code this up very quickly, yeah, I will just do a bubble tea shop. And then, um, oh, no, that's, yep. Uh, actually, that was a bubble tea shop, was that? That was no, that was bubble tea milk. So bubble tea shop was here. Uh, it's great, and then it's going to use enumerate and so on. And and yep. So now, what is enumerate doing? It's going to do this, and then I just uh, code it up and all the attributes and inputs and output, all the VIs are all taken care of. So let's just look at the finished example. It takes about yeah, max ten minutes to um, code it up. And um, so then, so here I've created, uh, this is a inter the design for this design pattern. And yep, and what this is doing is showing the um, uh, flyweight design pattern. Uh, when I'm creating uh, objects, here I have a factory. I'm going to create a lot of different um, bubble teas. And I'm going to make a beverage. I'm, I'm going to get out the reference for that new beverage. And this make beverage will use a, a map to say that if it already exists, it's going to return the existing one, or otherwise it's going to create it and add it into the memory and then return it. So yeah, so it's a little bit of factory. So that's a, the flyaway design pattern if you haven't uh, used that before. Okay, uh, that's demoed and ready to go. And yeah, how to help out. Yep, you find it on uh, GitHub and you have under issues, you can just add new issues or just, yeah, fire me an email with a new request. And yeah, so I think that's it. So uh, let's uh, start asking, answering questions now. Let's uh, see, where is my... Um, so, okay, uh, Matthew said, it seems strange to add the Active Framework Library to your project. Why is this done? Okay, yeah, uh, so if you don't have the Active Framework project, uh, you won't be able to easily um, find that uh, child uh, or that, that the parent class. So uh, that's why we uh, add it. Um, so uh, yeah, so the um, active framework. Uh, this list down here with the parents you can uh, inherit from, they are they are classes in your project, and you won't be able to see that there is an actor there unless you add it. So that's why we add it into it. It will of course automatically be added in the project, but it will be under dependencies anyway. Uh, so yeah, that's just a way to get it into. Another question is, does this conversion tool support other text specs other than C Sharp? We, yep, it supports Java and uh, C Sharp. I did that because they are the pure uh, object oriented programming and they could be uh, yeah, linked to LabVIEW then. And uh, just now, since a lot of, in, a lot of um, solution design, if you look at design um, solutions out there, they're using interfaces. And that's great now in LAVI 2020 when we actually natively support interfaces. So that will automatically create those for us. So it's really good. 
Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Feel free to test it and come in. Uh, come with um, ideas of how to improve it. Or yeah, you can just uh, clone it and um, yeah. So you just go. Open GDS, maybe GitHub or something like that. Come to the landing page and view on GitHub. And uh, yep. So if you want to clone it, uh, we actually currently, I'm currently working on the LV2020 branch. You have the details in here. So that's the branch that uh, is uh, with interface support. Yeah, and we have a few contributors here already, but feel free. Hi, oh, yeah. thanks, Francis. Uh, so I started with this uh, UML model uh, 20 years ago. Uh, that's when we actually uh, first supported object-oriented programming in LabVIEW before it was natively supported. And I wanted to test uh, how to do a editor um, because I need OO for that. Uh, where, yeah, all object, all graphical editors are based on OO and thought, I'm going to test our OO engine to see if it actually is good enough for an OO, language, for an OO application. So that's why I did this UML modeler. And then it just uh, took off from there. So it's the UML is one big part of it. And then the, 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 the class provider that um, adds the right click functions and all the features is for the for the class provided creation and analyzing of the code. Oh yeah, nice to hear. Yeah. So um, there are more features of course, but uh, yeah, uh, the documentation of this is of course, I haven't had time uh, to document so much. There are some help here, uh, but it's very old. Up, yeah, it's not updated and yeah, definitely, yeah probably need the time and help to update all the help and demos and example. And I had the, I had videos for all this stuff and I posted on, um, upload them to uh, YouTube, but they have now been uh, blocked, removed or made private. So we can't see them again. So I might have to recreate those and upload them again. So yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay then. Okay. Thanks guys. Um, hope you enjoyed it and yeah, let me know if you need any more features. Uh, cool stuff. Yeah. Uh, for the actor framework, I haven't used too much. Uh, so here you yeah. use it every day. That's good. We currently use in 2020 by switching 2021. That's good. That's, when you switch, you're going to get a new user experience and new features as well. That's good. Yeah. So go to 2020 or 21. That's um, yeah, really good. Okay. Thanks guys. Have a good one. Take care. See ya.